It's estimated that $35 trillion in wealth will be lost in the next financial crash. Global stock markets just recorded their worst week in well over a year, with the Nasdaq sliding by its biggest percentage since March 2020. And many news outlets are now reporting about the coming stock market crash, which is causing panic among investors. Relax. Breathe. In this video, I'm going to explain in plain English what's going on, why everyone is concerned, and whether you should be too. But before we begin, let's make sure this video doesn't crash by leaving a like for the YouTube algorithm. And hey, if you're new around here and want to level up your personal finance game in a safe and reliable environment, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. All right, let's get started. So we're going to start this video off by revisiting some of the fundamentals of investing. The reason why is because in times when the media is loud, our brains tend to seize up and forget everything we thought we knew about investing. Please keep these fundamentals in mind as we progress through the video. For the purposes of this section and throughout the video, I'm going to be referencing The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. The crux of the problem in the stock market is valuation. The price of everything has accelerated to seemingly unjustifiable levels and because of that, investors are expecting a crash. To understand this fully, you need to understand what the price of a stock actually actually is. The price of any stock on the stock market represents what the market is willing to pay today in order to be entitled to the cash which the market expects the company to earn in the future. With that in mind, let's look at two quotes from Graham. The future value of every investment is a function of its present price. The higher the price you pay, the lower your return will be. Based on our understanding of what a stock price is, this makes sense. Because the higher the price you pay, the higher your expectations are for future company cash flows, whether you realize that or not. High expectations increases the likelihood of the company failing to meet those expectations, which will reduce the value of your investment. The intelligent investor realizes that stocks become more risky, not less, as their prices rise, and less risky, not more, as their prices fall. Again, this makes total sense, but it's something that the vast majority of investors fail to understand. Most people react to investment performance on the basis that green is good and red is bad. But in fact, rising prices mean rising expectations, which results in higher risk. Therefore, a key understanding for you during this chaotic period in the stock market is that as the price of any investment decreases, it actually becomes a more attractive property position. Before we jump into the meat of what's going on, I briefly want to touch on the implications of selling investments and what you need to consider. Because the temptation for most investors during times like these is to sell. Again, have this information at the front of your mind as we discuss the facts in just a minute. Stay with me here. The key thing to remember is that every financial decision you make must be made in the context of your own personal circumstances. There is no one size fits it's all answer for the question as to whether or not you should sell your investments. But should you sell, here's what you need to consider. If you sell at a loss, that loss becomes a realized loss, meaning that you've actually lost money. This goes against Warren Buffett's most famous piece of investing advice. Rule number one is never lose money, and rule number two is never forget rule number one. Yes, I know it's obvious, but the rationale behind the advice is very solid. If you sell an investment at a 50% loss and reinvested the money from the sale, your new investment would need to grow by 100% in order to just break even. So with that in mind, when you sell any investment, you need to fundamentally believe that the decision makes sense in the context of your personal circumstances and what you're trying to achieve. Once it's done, it cannot be undone. Now, if you sell at a gain, that gain becomes a realized gain, meaning that you've actually made money. At that point, point, you'll need to consider 
tax. Once again is realized the tax man needs to be paid and depending on where in the world you live the rate applicable to the gain might be unfavorable. So with our understanding of stock market valuations and the implications of selling investments let's discuss what's going on. A lot of the media attention is centered around comments made by Jeremy Grantham. Now if you don't know Jeremy he's the co-founder and chief investment strategist of the Boston-based investment management company GMO. GMO manages over $60 billion in assets for its various clients around the globe. In January 2021, Jeremy commented on the state of the stock market, saying how at the time it was showing characteristics of extreme overvaluation, explosive price increases, frenzied issuance and speculative investor behavior. This led him to the belief that this would go down as one of the greatest bubbles in financial history. To be fair to Jeremy, he was fairly on the nose here, considering everything that happened in 2021 after these comments with regards to SPACs, short squeezes, altcoins in the crypto space and NFTs. Fast forward one year later and Jeremy is back again with his latest piece entitled Let the Wild Rumpus Begin. Now in this article Jeremy references the US stock market crashes of 1929 and 2000 as well as the Japanese stock market crash of 1989 as being so called super bubbles. Meaning that in the last 100 years we've only had three instances of this kind of bubble according to Jeremy. What we're seeing today in the stock market is the fourth super bubble. So why does Jeremy believe this to be true? First of all he references the rate at which prices increased after the crash in March 2020. Even after the stock market's worst week in a long time the S&P 500 has still returned over 90% to investors since the pandemic and the Nasdaq over 100%. Jeremy notes that in all previous super bubbles the same rapid acceleration was seen. For context we know that the average annual return of the market over the last 70 years has been about 10%. We can also look at the price to earnings ratio of the S&P 500 as a whole and compare this to the average since the 1950s to get an idea of how overvalued the market may be. The latest data suggests the PE ratio to be 35 now what this means is that it would take you nearly 36 years to recoup the value of your initial investment in the S&P 500 if profits were to remain constant at the current rate. This is 79% higher than the market average. The higher the PE ratio of any investment, the higher your expectations are for earnings growth. Secondly, Jeremy references the recent underperformance of highly speculative stocks. Now, Bloomberg gave the example of Cathie Wood's ARK Innovation ETF. If you don't know Cathie Wood or ARK, essentially their investment ethos is centered around disruptive innovation. They invest in companies who they believe are developing technologies that will change the world. Sounds good in theory, but in reality, it involves investing in companies who have very little earnings today in the hope that they become industry leaders in the future. Again, to quote Graham, obvious prospects for physical growth in a business do not translate into obvious profits for investors. The experts do not have dependable ways of selecting and concentrating on the most promising companies in the most promising industries. This is essentially ARC. After a very strong 2020, the ARK Innovation ETF has tanked by over 50%. This is a great metric for the performance of speculative stocks as a whole, because ARK effectively lives and breeds speculation. Jeremy mentions that in both the Great Depression and the dot-com bubble, the speculative stocks were the first to go before the bubble burst. The most startling statistic quoted by Jeremy is that one third of all NASDAQ listed stocks are down more than 50% from their one year highs. This is the result of a rational exuberance on the part of investors. The idea that stocks only go up. But when reality hits home and investors realize that the value of their investment is only as good as the price they paid for it, well that's when one third of the Nasdaq and funds like ARK Innovation tank by 50%. Finally, Jeremy references the crazy behavior of investors over the course of the last two years. And he believes that what we've seen is in fact worse than the dot-com bubble. He specifically references meme stocks, electric vehicle stocks, cryptocurrencies, and NFTs. GameStop, Neo, Shiba Inu. The commonality between these names is the speculation which surrounded them and the unprecedented acceleration of their value. This resulted in a euphoric stage in the market where all sense of reason was 
disregarded. Prior to this, it was rare to hear conversations about investing in your social circles. But with the popularization of meme stocks and crypto, it wasn't before long that I was hearing investing chatter on a near daily basis. This is a telltale sign of a bubble. If you haven't seen my investing rewind for 2021, that video will tell you everything you need to know about what Jeremy is referring to. In consideration of all those facts, Jeremy believes a crash of around 40% is coming for the broader market. But how exactly did we get here? It's no secret that trillions of dollars in euros have been printed by the Fed and European central banks over the course of the last two years in order to keep the economy afloat. Interest rates were kept at near zero during this time also, making it very cheap to borrow money. This has naturally supported the stock market and as Jeremy puts it, has led to a false perception of wealth among investors. As well as this, all the extra money circulating in the economy has resulted in record levels of inflation. Things like cars, petrol, clothes and even food have started to become more expensive due to rising prices. There's lots of demand for goods and services in the economy, but there isn't enough supply to match that demand because of disruptions to our global supply chains caused by the pandemic. Inflation is problematic because it increases the cost of living. We know that the Fed is planning on increasing interest rates in March. Increasing interest rates reduces inflationary pressure because it becomes more expensive to borrow money. But here's the key thing to remember. Rising interest rates have a tendency to spell bad news for stocks. Remember earlier we said that the price of any stock is calculated as the present value of the market's expectations for future cash flows. As interest rates rise, the present value of future cash flows decreases. Therefore, unless the market increases its expectations for future cash flows, which may or may not be feasible, stock prices will fall. This is one of the main reasons why investors are worried. The other cause for concern at the moment is the price of property. Nominal house prices have increased significantly across all OECD member countries since 2015. In the first eight months of 2021 alone, housing prices increased by 11% in Ireland. Part of this increase is attributable to mismatches in supply and demand, while another part is attributable to rising costs of construction. Jeremy Grantham believes that on top of the current super bubble in stocks were also in quote the broadest and most extreme global real estate bubble in history. He compares this to the crash in Japan in 1989 where both a stock market and real estate bubble popped at the same time. Japan has not yet recovered from that crash. However, many analysts don't agree with Jeremy. They believe that the problem is rooted in supply not keeping up with demand. And unlike the housing bubble of 2006, there are no aggressive borrowing practices fueling house prices. But irrespective as to whether or not there's a housing bubble, affordability is a major issue facing most countries. This issue is only going to get worse as interest rates on mortgages start to increase. If I'm concerned about anything, it's how future economic conditions will affect real incomes and to what extent wealth inequality will increase in our society. So what does all of this mean for you? No matter what way we look at it, interest rates are going to have to increase in the near future to tackle inflation. Rising interest rates typically result in lower stock prices, meaning you could make an educated guess that a downwards correction will come as rates rise. However, the timing and extent of this correction is totally unknown. To quote Graham, in the financial markets hindsight is forever 2020 but foresight is legally blind thus for most investors market timing is a practical and emotional impossibility making investment decisions in anticipation of an uncertain future event is equivalent to gambling sure you could be right but you equally could be wrong this is why it's so important to have clearly defined objectives that keep you on track regardless of what's going on being in a constant state of reaction increases the risk of making decisions purely on the basis of emotion. Some of you have watched this video looking for an answer on what you should do, but there is no one size fits all approach. And this is something I've tried to reiterate many times on my channel. As I mentioned earlier, every financial decision you make must be made in the context of your own personal circumstances. Ask yourself these questions. Why did you start investing in the first place? What do you want to achieve 
achieve from investing and will exiting your investments now get you closer to achieving that goal? An investor who's in their 20s is in a completely different scenario to an investor in their 40s or 50s. And age is only one of the factors to consider. A fall in stock prices can represent an opportunity for those with long investment horizons. But equally for those approaching retirement, falling stock prices can spell trouble. For those of you just starting out on your investing journey, and even for my veteran viewers, let this be a time of reflection. Did you make decisions based solely on emotion? And are the consequences of those decisions now coming back to haunt you in the form of uncertainty? Or do you find yourself surprisingly cool, calm, and collected? And is this the result of investing sensibly? I started investing seriously in December 2019. Three months later, the market tanked by over 30%. Yes, it was uncomfortable, but I had objectives. And based on those objectives and my own circumstances, there was no reason to sell. I approach investing with a long-term mindset and I try to ignore what happens in the short term as best I can. Because when you zoom out on the all-time chart, the picture becomes a lot clearer. I'll leave you with some final words from Graham. What you don't do is as important to your success as what you do. So I really do hope you enjoyed the video here today. As always, if you did enjoy the video, please do let me know in the comment section below. Leave a like in the video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.